I'm Hemant Mehta. And this is Jessica Blumke. And you're listening to the podcast for FriendlyAtheist.com. Our guest today is Dale McGowan. Dale is the author of a number of excellent books about atheism. His books, Parenting Beyond Belief and Raising Free Thinkers, are all about bringing up children without religion. He's also the author of Atheism for Dummies, a book that surprisingly didn't exist until 2013. He also began Foundation Beyond Belief, a nonprofit encouraging atheists to give to charity. And full disclosure, he's also a manager, the manager of the Atheist Channel on Patheos.com, which is where my website is hosted. His latest book, In Faith and in Doubt, is all about relationships between atheists and religious believers. So, Dale, thank you for being with us tonight. Good to be here. Thanks. So, Dale, what do we call these relationships? Is there a special term we can use? Well, yeah, I actually uh, went fishing for a special term. Uh, <laughs> I, I wanted to have something concise but immediately understandable, and uh, I actually threw it open to my blog readers, and people came up with all these fantastic words, uh, but none of them were immediately accessible. You didn't know what they were. So I have been calling it the secular religious marriage, and that uh, really gives a good sense of uh, – uh, how wide this net really is. It's uh, it's people who are living without religion themselves who are married to someone who is living with religion. That's the best description I can think of. You actually said in like the introduction of your book, someone had suggested mixistential. <laughs> mixistential, isn't that beautiful? I just loved that. that was my favorite one, and and I just couldn't I couldn't pull the trigger on it because it just uh, it, it would require uh, additional explanation. Yeah, and I guess uh, Mexican probably will rub people <laughs> the wrong way. So. Um, so what would you say is the, the chief number one issue that you come across when you're talking about interfaith-ish marriages? That one wasn't as good. <laughs> yeah, it's a, it's a mouthful. <laughs> uh, well, the, the issue is actually very depending on what the situation is for the couple. Mm-hmm. Um, if you... Um, uh, for example, if you have a couple that knew that they were different going into the marriage, uh, the issues are going to be different and they're going to be much fewer uh, than a couple that was the same uh, from the beginning. In, in most cases, that would mean they were both religious and one of them became non-religious, became a non-believer at some point. Uh, that's a couple that's going to have much more significant issues and uh, they revolve around this sort of this feeling in, in many cases of betrayal, of of having uh, entered the marriage under one understanding and then being in a new understanding. And uh, for a lot of people, that's just a really devastating uh, thing. It it feels to the religious partner frequently as if nothing that the marriage was based on holds true anymore. So uh, what you really have to do in that situation, um, and and really uh, across the board, is recognize the difference between beliefs and values. Uh, a lot of times those terms are used interchangeably, and they really are not uh, interchangeable. Uh, someone can differ in their beliefs, meaning what they think is true, and still hold the same values as uh, someone else. And one of the things that makes these uh, relationships frequently work where people think they, they really shouldn't is that uh, the couple really shares the same basic values. They can articulate the same moral and ethical values uh, between themselves even though they differ on uh, the theological frame. So, uh, um, but the, the issue that uh, most often uh, couples will encounter is kids. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's when kids come into the picture uh, that things uh, related to family identity and family tradition, that tends to be the issue regardless of, you know, what the couple situation is that um, trips the wire of the difference and frequently uh, uh, creates problems. So questions well like, they, where do you go to church? How do you learn about morals and ethics? How mm-hmm. do you deal with re- baptisms, religious yeah. family members, Rest things like passage. that? All that, yeah, that whole that whole uh, constellation of issues. And then even something as basic as uh, family identity. Uh, are we a Catholic family? Are we a non-religious family? That feeling that somehow we have to have a label uh, to define the family. And the couples that navigate that best are the ones who really recognize that you can participate in a religious community. You can participate in uh, non-religious uh, questioning and uh, discussion and so on, uh, and not label kids in either direction. You can really uh, raise them with space uh, around them, whether you're religious or not, mm-hmm. uh, and allow them in the long run to answer those questions themselves. 
So I feel like a common theme, like you mentioned, has to be, you know, we went into the marriage both Catholic and then I lost my faith. What happens if the other thing happens? What if we went into the marriage non-religious or atheists and all of a sudden somebody finds God? Does that, Does that happen? People do that. Uh, it does happen. It does happen. Actually, I even had a, a couple that I interviewed uh, where both happened. They actually, uh, they switched. No, uh, they really? The, the, yeah. They went as a marriage, a Catholic marriage to an atheist, and the atheist became a Baptist, and the Catholic became an atheist. Um, and <laughs> what? That, and then they got divorced. <laughs> they, actually did, they actually did get divorced, oh. yes. <laughs> uh, Well, now I feel like crap. <laughs> yeah, well, and the, and the reason you can see why uh, is because um, they had both rejected uh, what the other one was. They had both been what the other one was and then rejected. I mean, it was it sort of doubles, yeah. you know, doubles down on the tension. But um, when someone turns religious, when someone is an atheist and they turn religious after uh, marriage, in many cases, it's the result of um, uh, either they're returning to the religion of their childhood, that's often the case, especially when uh. kids come along, uh, and they just sort of have that yearning for that identity and that connection, or in some cases, they encounter a personal crisis of some sort. There are a lot of people who, actually, in this case, that's what it was. The atheist who became a Baptist um, had a severe problem with alcoholism. Uh-huh. And uh, he ended up having a, a, a relative who uh, counseled him and helped him out quite a bit and ended up, ended up bringing him into the Baptist church, and that was very, uh, that was very helpful to him. So in some cases, that's, um, uh, that's the dynamic that happens. But that issue... Uh, someone becoming religious was actually a great deal less common in my survey than the other direction, a religious spouse becoming non-religious. So do you have kind of a ballpark percentage of how often these, do these marriages tend to work out if everybody goes in with their eyes open, or do you see a higher rate of failure? Yeah, actually, if they go in with their eyes open, if they already uh, had the difference established uh, at the marriage, mm-hmm. uh, the um, the rate of divorce is... Uh, Divorce rates are extremely difficult to uh, actually pin down for reasons that I talk about in the book. Sure. It seems like an easy thing to do, but divorce rate and uh, religious identity, really hard to tie together. But every indication is that they are as strong or possibly stronger than relationships, uh, than just relationships across the board, the, the, uh, um, the average. Uh, there's actually an interesting thing that um, has been nailed down in a couple of different studies um, that shows interfaith couples have um, a certain strength in communication that uh, same-faith couples don't necessarily have. It's called dyadic consensus, the ability to come to agreement uh, on issues of importance to the relationship. And it turns out that interfaith couples have a markedly stronger ability to do this than same-faith couples on average because they have to. (laughs) So they're Right out of the gate, right from the beginning, they're having to confront this difference between them and talk about it. If you have the same uh, worldview, you have a tendency to not encounter those things early on and make a lot of assumptions about your shared uh, values and beliefs. And so you can get much further into the relationship without developing the communication skills that will be helpful in that. It's kind of like you over... It's like you overcame a hurdle before you even went into the marriage, so, you know, other things may not be as big, and maybe a lot of couples don't have to deal with that much tension that early in a relationship. Right. Yeah, I think that's exactly it. And uh, so we sort of go in swinging three bats, and uh, then we're just so much better able to meet the challenges that come up later. Do you think that um, the prevalence of mixed-faith marriages are rising or falling, like, especially with the advent of, of, of online dating or the, the growing popularity of online dating, where people can be really picky about, you know, I'm not just meeting somebody in a bar and, like, crossing my fingers that we have something in common. It's I'm, I'm looking for an atheist who takes it very seriously. Right, exactly. So do you right. think that we're going to see fewer interfaith relationships, or is that not going to play, fa- play a factor? Play a factor. Oh, no, much more, uh, much more interfaith relationships. Actually, oh. in, the, uh, 19, in the 1950s, um, interfaith uh, marriages were somewhere around 20%. Uh, new marriages in the 50s, somewhere around 20% were interfaith, and that includes intra-Protestant. That includes the Methodist and the Episcopalian and that sort of thing. Um, by the 2000s, that had risen to 45% of all marriages that were interfaith to some degree, including intra-Protestant. So it has more than doubled wow. in a couple of generations. And the reason for this is pretty clear. In the early part of the 20th century and before that, people didn't mix 
much. It was very common to be born in a Catholic neighborhood or a Jewish neighborhood or something like that, and to not know anyone else uh, until you're well into your uh, adulthood who is from a, another uh, worldview. So uh, it made sense that Catholics married Catholics, and everyone they knew who was a Catholic was married to a Catholic. There wasn't much mixing. Uh, fast forward to today, the average American moves 11.7 times in a lifetime. And a lot of those moves are crossing socioeconomic boundaries. They're moving into populations with other races, other religions. We are mixing much more thoroughly uh, than we ever did before. And that mixing is leading to every kind of mix uh, in terms of marriage, including interfaith. So when everyone gets interfaithfully married, mm -hmm. we are going to like basically round out to we're all going to be progressive Christians is what, what I'm saying. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's we're all Unitarians. I yeah, exactly. All Unitarians. <laughs> <laughs> what surprised you the most when you were talking to all of these couples in these mixed relationships? Was Was there anything you learned that probably doesn't sound like common sense in retrospect. Like, I guess it makes sense to me that, okay, if you overcame your religious differences before the marriage, you'll probably be okay afterwards. What surprised you? Oh, there's one big surprise. Uh, one, I, I went back in the data to be sure, you know, from the survey. I surveyed uh, nearly a thousand people and interviewed 17 couples in depth. And the one thing that I thought I knew is that extended family pressure is a major source of conflict and tension in, in mixed marriages. And it turned out that is not the case, at least if, if this sample group is to be believed. A very low percentage, somewhere close to 10, I think it was 10 to 12 percent, actually said that extended family pressure was a significant issue for them. Mm. For most of the rest, it was either a very mild issue or no issue whatsoever. And I, the reason I was certain it was otherwise is that I deal with non-religious parents. I mean, this is what my work has been for, uh, for eight years now. And I've talked to hundreds and hundreds of people who are having terrible trouble with their extended family and, and feeling a lot of pressure. Well, of course, that's a reporting error because I'm hearing from the people who are having trouble and I'm not hearing from the ones who aren't. Mm -hmm. And so I think it's actually the greatest surprise for me was that most extended family situations uh, are at least mild in the pressure that the couples are feeling. Now, of course, those who are experiencing the conflict and the tension, it can be really debilitating. And I talk about ways to uh, work around that, ways to um, decrease the tension. But that had to be the single biggest surprise in writing this book. Yeah, it's surprising just listening to it now. I thought there's literally yeah. no way that's correct. <laughs> but so, I believe you. <laughs> how... How do these couples, uh, forget the extended family, how do these couples, when they are coming from different backgrounds, how do they deal with something like a baptism that maybe one parent wants and the other parent, uh, well, I guess it depends. Some of them may just think like, eh, whatever, it's a ritual and I don't care for it. I would think some of them would be like, no, my child's not getting baptized because whatever, I don't like it, it's stupid. Or it's... like a bar about mitzvah. Or about mitzvah, yeah, exactly. Like they want nothing to do with religion. How do they handle those issues? Yeah, it's um, uh, that's just one of those things that varies a great deal depending on the uh, the couple and what it means to each of them. Uh, for some religious people, those kind of rituals aren't even important. Uh, for some non-religious people, they don't mind. They look at it as just a ritual, and it, mm -hmm. if I don't buy into the meaning, it's perfectly fine. But uh, for my wife and uh, and for me, uh, that was a bit of an issue when our son was that age, mm -hmm. and I said. Um, I really wasn't comfortable with him being uh, baptized, and uh, she really wanted him to be. And we, at that point, were uh, attending a Baptist megachurch in, in uh, Minneapolis. And uh, so she said, hey, there's this thing called the dedication. We can actually do a dedication ceremony instead of baptism. And I said, uh, great, that sounds like a terrific compromise. We'll just do that. And that's because I didn't know what it meant. <laughs> I looked into what it meant. What we were doing was dedicating him to Christ. I mean, it was <laughs> really very, you know, uh, and, and the worst part is the minister at one point in the ceremony turns to us and said, do you, the father and mother of this child, pledge to raise him in the, in the discipleship of Christ <gasps> and to lead his, his feet in the direction of the sanctuary and all this stuff, What did you, you say? Know? What did you say? <laughs> I, I <laughs> said, sure, why not, you know? I mean, yeah. what are you going to say? At that Just point, go with the flow at that point. But the, the really nice thing in that is in that moment, my wife squeezed my hand really hard, 
And what she was saying was not, oh, gosh, isn't this a lovely moment in the life of our child? <laughs> what she was saying was, oh, crap, I had no idea oh. that this is what this was. I'm so sorry. We will not do this with our second child. I got all of that in a hand the squeeze. squeeze. Yeah. So, so if, I think if the couple are earnest enough about you know, respecting each other's wishes and desires, they can work these things out. Uh, they can uh, they can find compromises. They can this this particular one wasn't the compromise I was looking for, <laughs> but there are lots of uh, there are lots of ways to satisfy the desire for ritual, the desire for identity, and so on, uh, without compromise without completely compromising one partner's wishes or the other. And that's just that's marriage. I mean, that's it's just like any of these things in marriage where you uh, run into differences. Uh, they can be, they can frequently, I should say, they can frequently be worked out. Not always. Uh, but more often than we think, these things are actually, uh, give you an opportunity to, to exercise that dyadic consensus, that ability to, to, uh, work things out. I can actually speak personally to that because um, as Bloomkey family legend goes, um, both my brother and myself were baptized into the Catholic Church, question mark, because my dad, uh, quote, didn't want to hear crap from my grandparents. Mm -hmm. So I think I'm on the Catholic rolls somewhere. I should look into that. (laughs) Can I get get that erased? Or am I stuck? Yeah, I think you actually can. Oh, I, hey. I saw somebody uh, uh, blog about that at some point. It, it's a very difficult thing, but you can do it. <laughs> so if two if two parents are really going at it, one's uh, strongly against religion, one's strongly for religion, um, is there anything they can do to salvage their relationship at that point? Uh, yeah. Uh, I actually um, talked to some couples who, uh, who really engaged on the, um, the beliefs. Uh, but they sep- were able to separate those things out from the respect for each other as individuals, and that's the that's the key. If people aren't able to do that, if you personalize it, if the atheist is communicating the idea that uh, you're an idiot for believing these things, mm-hmm. and if the religious person is communicating the idea that I think you are an immoral, hellbound wretch, you know, um, if that's where we are, there's no magic pill. Mm-hmm. You know, you cannot hold each other in contempt. You know, this is something that John Gottman actually talks about as the fourth horseman of uh, 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 the death of a relationship um, is contempt. If you're ac- you've actually reached that point, um, forget it. You know, there's no uh, there's no uh, saving it. But if you are able to engage really seriously, and you've we've all had friends like this, right, where we could really dig in on religious questions. We're coming at it from different perspectives, but we could keep our selves, our, our um, you know, value as individuals out of it. Couples that can do that can really engage. They can really become deeply engaged in it and even enjoy uh, the uh, uh, honest engagement in that. Uh, I That wasn't the kind of relationship we had because neither of us, uh, during the 13 years that my wife identified as religious, neither of us dug in to that extent. Neither of us had our identity so wrapped up in our religion that we did that. But uh, it is um, it is survivable uh, if you can keep yourself detached from uh, the religion itself. But that has to be a challenge for pe- for especially religious people, because in, in my experience, people, their religion is very much tied up in their personal identity, and it's hard to... That's one of the reasons I think a lot of atheists get criticized, because we will criticize somebody's religious beliefs, but people take that personally. People take that to heart. So do, Absolutely. Do people, yeah. do you find one side or the other? Do religious people or atheists have a harder time separating from each other or separating from that identity? Yeah, this was actually a question that I asked in, in uh, very carefully and in, in detail in the survey. Um, I wanted to know, because I surveyed the non-religious partners and the religious partners separately. Mm -hmm. And uh, I said, when you, first of all, do you engage on questions of belief? Do you, uh, you know, engage that strongly? And how does that make you feel? And then I had a number of um, uh, descriptors. And the religious partner was far more likely to personalize it, far more likely to feel threatened and angry and upset and sad uh, by... Uh, the exchange. So that's definitely a risk. Um, That's when, you know, if you know that, um, that's when uh, the non-religious partner has a choice in how uh, to engage and, you know, how strongly to engage if it's something that really upsets uh, the religious partner. 
Uh, but this is also an impetus for uh, some people to change. You know, there are a lot of couples who said uh, it, we were both religious and then my husband became non-religious and we had a lot of sort of arguments about this sort of thing and it began to get to me. I started thinking about it and I became non-religious or the other way around. Um, so um, uh, it, I, I think you can't, my guess is that it's, it's safe to say you can't stay there for long. You know, mm -hmm. if you're really in that sort of pitched emotional um, connection um, that I think most people would not be able to stay right there and have their relationship uh, in good shape. Either somebody's going to ratchet it down a bit or somebody's going to change their perspective. You know, something's going to give at some point, I think. Is there any difference? The couples we're talking about, uh, they're, they're probably, correct me if I'm wrong, they're probably regular couples with regular day jobs, something like that. Mm -hmm. What happens when one of these people, let's say the religious person in the relationship is like a pastor? Uh, what if the, I don't know, if the atheist is someone who's, I don't know, a professional atheist, I don't know if that, whatever. A uh, David Silver. All three of them, yeah. I mean, <laughs> yeah. When, when their livelihoods are kind of based on yeah. their religious beliefs, does that change the equation at all? Or does it, or can they still, you know, find ways to compromise? Oh, yeah, it really does. Um, but uh, basically the way I put it is um, uh, one of the things that makes it difficult for a couple is if both partners um, have a very uh, high identity with their worldview. Um, if one of them does, it's frequently fine, uh, because if the other one is, you know, sort of more moderate and, and you know, eh, it's not that big a deal to me, um, then it, uh, the uh, the more passionately involved uh, partner can really um, go to town with that, you know, public uh, advocacy, uh, and uh, and often the relationship is just fine. It's when both of them are intensely engaged that you really get an issue. I mean, one of the things that I uh, wrote about in the book is my own wedding, for example. Uh, my own wedding was as religious as it could possibly have been. Um, <laughs> it, was, uh, it was in a Lutheran church. We had a Methodist minister. Uh, I was marrying a Southern Baptist. We had an Episcopal organist. I mean, it was just like a, <laughs> just a conclave of Protestantism in this, uh, in this spot. And I didn't care at all. And the reason is that my atheist identity was not that big a deal to me at that point. What was a big deal to me at that point was my musical identity. I had degrees in music. I, um, you know, that was, that was who I was. And so if we had a crappy uh, musical wedding, that would have been a big deal. But we had the uh, string quartet from the San Francisco Conservatory. We had this spectacular organist. I mean, it was really musically a fantastic thing, and I was really thrilled that it was satisfying my identity in that way. Um, if I had been had the kind of secular and humanist identity that I have now, that marriage wouldn't have flown. <laughs> I would I would have really felt like a stranger at the event. Mm -hmm. But in uh, in many I was perfectly happy the way I was to let her have the kind of wedding that she wanted to have. It didn't bother me at all. And I think it, that translates into. Um, relationships overall. If you have one partner for whom the identity is sort of a shrugging thing, you know, it's not that big a deal, um, then they can really flex quite a bit uh, in terms of some of these, uh, you know, having the partner, the other partner go a little more the distance. So let's change gears a little bit. We recently ended uh, the Foundation Beyond Belief's first ever conference that happened not too long ago. And this was a conference where the speakers, and by the way, I'm on the chair of the board. Dale is the executive director of it. These speakers, surprisingly, didn't talk about religion so much. It wasn't about atheism. It was much more about, yeah, I'm an atheist, but this is what I'm doing to make the world a better place. And I yeah. think that's what really made it stand out. I'm wondering, what did you take away from that whole experience? What did you get from it that you think you've never gotten at any other uh, atheist event? Well, I, I think that's really a, um, an apt uh, transition, because it, it really is very much the same. It's, um, I was, uh, you know, I'm much more engaged in my worldview than I was when I got married. But at the same time, I'm also done... <laughs> with talking constantly about the fact that I've separated from religion. Uh, that's, uh, that was fine for a while, but I'm, I'm on to wanting to uh, sort of just be who I am and in the beliefs that I have and actuate those and make the world a better place, as you say. Uh, so I was struck, and pretty much everybody I talked to was struck, by just how different that felt 
in this event to go through a day and a half of speakers and almost never even hear a reference to religion. And it's not even like we were walking on eggshells and trying to avoid it. It just wasn't relevant to what we're talking yeah. about. We we're all know you're about, an atheist, right. so now what? Yeah. 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 Exactly. So I, I think my really my, my hope is that uh, um, that feeling can become a little bit infectious. And you know, we don't by any means have to get away from religious critique. There's a lot to be done there. But to just say, gosh, doesn't it feel great to sometimes detach from that constant, you know, bouncing ourselves off another worldview and just look at the world through our own eyes and articulate the way that feels and what can we do with this now that we're here. It was really a, uh, a moving experience to me to see that uh, play out. Where do you see the organization and maybe even that conference? Where do you go from here? What should people be doing? Uh, you know, they're atheists. They want to make the world a better place. What can they do? Well, really, the very best thing people can do is, um, first of all, connect themselves to what's going on in the world. Uh, it seems like we're very connected um, because we're constantly involved in social media and so on. But it's different when you really connect with individuals, for example, an individual story. When you look at this, the current crisis that's going on at the U.S. border and you think of you know, 60,000 unaccompanied children um, who are likely to seek asylum at that border in, uh, during this year alone. Um, 60,000 is a number, but if you, um, right now on our website, we have a picture of a girl, of one child, who was found in the weeds at the, um, at the side of the Rio Grande. And uh, she's being escorted out by a border agent uh, in, uh, taken into custody. Uh, and it's just a, a very powerful image because we connect to that one person. I think that's the sort of thing that taps our empathy and makes me say, hey, I am in a position to help. Um, I'm an, and there is no, nobody else to help. There's no supernatural power to help. So humanism is actually a, a perfect worldview for really uh, engaging in the human ability to make the world better for somebody who doesn't have it as, uh, as fortunate as I, uh, as I do. Uh, that's what we want people to do. Engage that empathy and then act on it. Well, Dale, thank you so much for joining us today. And uh, the book about interfaith, inner, uh, whatever you want to call it, existential relationships, <laughs> is called In Faith and in Doubt. Thank you so much for being with us. Absolutely. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks for listening to the podcast for FriendlyAtheist.com. This episode was taped at Cinnamon Sound Studios in Aurora, Illinois, and the music was written and performed by Brad Chagdis. If you like what you're hearing, please consider making a contribution at Patreon.com slash Hemant. That's he man T. We appreciate your support. I'm Hemant Mehta. And I'm Jessica Bloomke. We hope you'll join us next time.